holding it and there's the potential energy in that lifted weight that can drop, it's, it's actually completely it's squashing, squashing. Squashing the nitrogen. And that wants to come back to its full volume and, and that's where the energy is stored. So exactly it's the same that. system. Okay. Um, I guess we're going to do this first without the accumulators. You've got, got it right. I don't have to pump though. No, no, no. All we've got to do is get the engine started. Can we fire up the engine? Thank you, Adrian. Using only the engine, the hydraulic pump creates a constant pressure of just over a quarter of a bar with which to drag the half-ton car. It moves, but it's slow. It's the equivalent of me pumping the model bridge with the stirrup pump on its own. But by charging the accumulators instead, we can build up the pressure and store much more energy. We can, and we might be able to put a bit more in as well. Wouldn't that be awful? What if we stored quite a lot more energy than we actually needed in there, and then deployed it all in one big lump? Is it just me, or is that machine really quite terrifying? There is a great deal of energy being stored up in the accumulator, so yeah. there's an inherent danger, I suppose. Good. Good. Well, you've confirmed all my worries. Charging the accumulators for just 10 minutes creates a pressure of 241 bar. That'll provide the same energy as having 23 of these engines pumping at once. Right, OK, if we're ready, everybody, this is it. Live firing. Three, two, one. <laughs> that was a lot of energy in one hit. I mean, all in one lump. That certainly worked, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I probably, in the interests of science and engineering, we should go and examine the damage. Yeah, yeah. yeah come on, let's go and have a look. Behold, a flying car, thanks to the instantaneous accumulator energy. Well, that's pretty tired, isn't it? I've seen worse. So a connection with the Victorian bridge puts modern jet aircraft into the air in just a matter of minutes. It's easy to see how powerful lifts and sophisticated stabilizers are essential to let an aircraft carrier do a job. But the business of keeping those aircraft flying is a hugely complex business and it raises many, many demands. Some less obvious, but no less critical. And one of those demands is the need for water. Not that kind of water, obviously, fresh water. And Illustrious needs a lot of fresh water. Illustrious gets through 200,000 litres of fresh water a day, and at that rate she can only store two days' supply. It's not just for drinking, more importantly it's for keeping the aircraft and machinery clean and in tip-top fighting condition. Three, two, one, ignition, lift off, lift off. And it's this need for fresh water that connects the aircraft carrier to the space race. If it's a problem getting hold of fresh water halfway around the world, imagine what it's like halfway to another world. That's exactly the problem NASA faced in the 1960s and 70s during the space race with the Soviet Union. Gemini and Apollo space missions took fresh water with them, but for long-term space travel and survival, that just wasn't going to be feasible. An answer was found through reverse osmosis, a purification process that can make fresh, drinkable water. To use reverse osmosis, you need to understand the pressures involved in osmosis. Osmosis is the movement of water through a membrane. It's fundamental to life on Earth. Plants draw moisture through their roots using osmosis, and it's the way all living things maintain their cell structure. In two neighbouring solutions, water will always flow from the weaker to the more concentrated solution. So from fresh water, say, to salt water. That's osmosis. It's what it does. Water molecules will continue to flow until the concentrations are balanced out. Inventor Frank Pryor has a novel way of showing it. Oh, 
have a jelly baby. Uh, that's very kind, thank you. I don't mind if I do, but where does osmosis come into a jelly baby? Well, if you take a little jelly baby like this, mm -hmm. okay, and you drop it in water overnight, oh, wait a minute. we start off with one that size, and it swells up to that. It soaks up the water, that's... Ah, oh, well, it's a little bit more than that. What's actually happening is that the outside of the jelly baby is acting as a membrane. Oh, so the water on the outside just views the stuff inside as a more concentrated solution. Yep. The molecules push their way in. Yes. Until, well, they're trying to balance out the concentrations. That's so right. that's actually osmosis, that's not osmosis. just jelly babies. That's right. But probably a better demonstration is using eggs. These eggs have no shell. They've been dissolved in vinegar, leaving just a membrane underneath. So this is a sort of rubbery membrane that we've all encountered uh, on an egg on the That's inside right. of the shell. Yep. So there's no actual osmosis happening yet. Not yet. Okay. Not yet. But if we take those and we pop one in water here and one in syrup here, okay, and then we leave them, we'll see what happens. All right. So this goes in the water. Just in, pop it in there like that. That's like so. Okay. okay. And that one there, just pop it into here. Okay. Oh, okay. And then we we'll leave them for a little while because osmosis is a slow process. So these are going to do some osmosis. Yep. Okay. What okay. Are we, is this a recipe? Well, here's two that we prepared earlier. It is a recipe. Yeah, there we go. And as you can see, first of all, if you look at the one in water, and you compare that to the size of the ordinary egg, it's enormous. That's right. And what's happened is water has moved from the outside into the egg to, to the sort of limit of stretch of the, of the membrane. But in the other jar, the syrup is more concentrated, so the water has flowed out of the egg, leaving it shriveled. So it's still osmosis, it's just coming out into the more concentrated solution, which here is outside rather than inside the egg. Correct. And as a result, it sort of collapsed and shriveled up. It may be simple to see how osmosis occurs in nature, but how exactly do shriveled eggs connect the aircraft carrier to the space race? In the 1960s, the Kennedy administration asked American scientists to find a way of producing fresh water from salt water. Originally, it was for the greenification of deserts, but NASA realized very quickly how useful it would be to their astronauts. It would allow for longer missions and put them ahead in the space race with the Soviet Union. Up until that time, expensive distillation was the only commercial method of artificially producing fresh water. However, scientists at UCLA had come up with a novel and much cheaper solution. They realized that water molecules are the smallest objects in an aqueous solution, much smaller than salt, bacteria and even viruses. So they designed membranes with microscopic holes that only let pure water molecules pass through. All they had to do was force an aqueous liquid through this membrane and in theory all that would come out the other side would be pure water. But there was just one problem, osmosis. We've already seen that water flows naturally into a concentrated solution, not the other way out of it. But what the scientists at UCLA were proposing was the exact opposite, reverse osmosis. They'd have to physically pump the concentrated solution through the membrane against the force of natural osmosis that wanted to force it the other way. The good news for those on an aircraft carrier is that there's water all around. Unfortunately, it's not the fresh water vital to maintain the aircraft or refresh the crew. So this can make drinking water. This can make drinking water from seawater. Okay. Yep. How? Okay. Let's have a look. Well, first of all, it works just by having a strong pump to be able to put a pressure on the membrane to drive it against the osmotic pressure. And roughly you need twice as much pressure as you do in the osmosis to drive it in the opposite direction. So this osmotic pressure is the pressure that comes about because of the desire of the water molecules in the weaker solution yep. to push through the membrane into That's the right. stronger solution. That's, and you've got to push, you've got to reverse that. You've got to That's right. It another way. That's the membrane you use. Oh, wow. That's the actual... That's the actual membrane. Fred, <laughs> I can't see the holes. <laughs> You well, won't. <laughs> but it's, that's what it is, isn't it? That's, it's basically that's just full of holes. It's full of holes. How small are these holes? These holes are 0.5 of, of a nanometer, okay? If you take a hair, that's 72,000 nanometers. Come down to a bacteria, that's about 10,000 nanometers. Come down to a virus, we're coming down to 100. And this is a half. They're very, very small holes. So it's fiddly to make this membrane, but yes. once you've made it, that is, that is, I'll have to take your word for it, 